Amen. Well, Merry Christmas Sunday, everybody. Yeah. I thought I'd actually dress up a little bit today and wear a tie. I only wear a tie a few times a year, but this feels like a special day, one of those special Sundays. God coming to earth as a little baby is a special day. We've been celebrating it all month long in this season that Christians have historically called Advent. Uh, In five days, it will be the birthday or anniversary of when God came to us in Jesus. So I want to welcome you all. Uh, If you happen to be in town uh, visiting family, and this is your first time here, uh, we're really glad that you're here. Uh, Or if you just happen to come to our church for this time for the first time, we are we're so glad. I'd love to meet you, get to know you, and hope you enjoy yourself today. My name is Dwayne. I'm the the founding and preaching pastor of our church. Uh, For this. Uh, For Advent this year, we have been taking the theme, the Son. Jesus is the one and only unique Son of the Father. And the story of his coming in the Gospel of John, it presents Jesus as being one with the Father and calls him the Word, that he is the Word or reason itself who then becomes flesh and dwells among us. And from that that principle there, we learned, we've learned that whether it's reason or hope or humility or last week joy, that Jesus as the Son is each one of those things because He embodies them in full to us. So this is the fourth and, and final week of Advent, the angel's candle of peace. And so we'll be looking at a few more verses from the first chapter of John in order to see and learn how Jesus is the Son of peace, the epitome and the embodiment of of peace. So uh, let's just go ahead uh, this Sunday right away and go ahead and read those verses, recognize them as God's word, thank him for them together, and, and then I'll pray over our time with them today. So we're in John chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. From his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, peace truly could only ever come from you. And I would pray this morning, Lord, that you would administer your peace to us. That we would delight in the peace that we have, and where there is a lack of peace, where there is inner turmoil, there is broken relationships that you would bring peace. We pray these things in the name of the Son, Jesus. Amen. Peace. Peace. What is peace, really? If you look it up in the dictionary, there's, there's basically two main definitions of, of peace. One, it can be an inner tranquility with a calm, quiet serenity inside. Or two, it's the absence of war, fighting, conflict. Hostility. Peace. Peace. If you look out in our world and the plane of culture, you can see that what is driving many people is their desire for peace. The longing and want for peace. If any of you watched any of the political debates this week, you saw a bunch of guys, a couple of gals who wrestle over foreign policy, trying to figure out how we can have peace in our country and in the world. There's no consensus. The political state of our country is one of deep divide between Republicans and Democrats and those who have strong feelings and opinions on a a host of issues. No peace. A few weeks ago, just a couple hours up the freeway from here, a bunch of people were killed in the San Bernardino shooting. This week on Tuesday, all the schools in L.A. were closed because of another threat. No peace. I was at the beach the other day and I was just sitting and reading and I was watching the, the surf and there was a guy sitting in the sand with his, his legs crossed and his arms out, palms up and making the, the O symbol with his hands meditating. If you've never seen that before, it's a popular Eastern or New Age practice where you attempt to find inner peace by emptying your mind and just chanting Om, Om, Om. The search for peace because inside there's no peace. In our country and culture today, uh, marijuana is more popular than ever before. Why? Because for just a few little hours, you can have a little bit of peace in your mind and in your body. But it's just a temporary cover-up. There's still no real peace inside. 
peace. We want peace. That's why most of us don't like and tend to avoid conflict, if at all possible. We don't like hard conversations with people. We just want peace and just wish we could just all get along somehow. You guys know uh, the, the song Peace on Earth by U2? Any, any U2 fans here? You guys like U2, right? Uh, here's a stanza from, a couple stanzas from it. Heaven on earth, we need it now. I'm sick of all this hanging around, sick of sorrow, sick of pain, sick of hearing again and again that there's going to be peace on earth. Jesus, in the song you wrote, the words are sticking in my throat. Peace on earth. Hear it every Christmas time. The hope in history won't rhyme, so what's it worth, this peace on earth? I think what, what Bono nails in this song is not only the, the longing for peace that we have, but our cultures cry for peace when there really isn't peace. Hope and history aren't rhyming because there's no peace and none of the supposed solutions for peace are working. It's actually very similar to something that God said through the prophet Jeremiah a few thousand years ago. Listen to this. This is Jeremiah 6.14. They have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. The world cries out, peace, peace, but there's no peace. There's no true healing of the wound. Peace, the need for peace. In Jesus, the Son of Peace, God sends the solution. It's actually one of Jesus' many nicknames in the Bible. One of his names is the Prince of Peace. The Bible calls him. The word peace, it actually doesn't occur in the text that we're looking at anywhere today. But if you're reading through the whole chapter, you, you kind of we talked a little bit about it last week. There's this sort of rhythm to it, like a, like a song. And, and I think when you're, you're, one of the most important questions you can ask when you're reading and studying the Bible is, what is the, what is the emotion that's here in this passage or in this text? What is the, the feeling that's, that's there? Is this a, a high and exuberant, excited text? Or is this something low and, and serious, or, or, or something different. Our verses today, they seem to have a, a peaceful mood to them. It's kind of like this, this awe. Oh, there's been this grand revelation about who Jesus is and what God has done in sending him in the world. And then it kind of concludes this inclusio to the chapter with this ah, oh, with his peace that comes. So I've got three points for us this morning. A fisher to a fountain, a mountain to a manger, and a rock to a revealing. Uh, with our first point today, a fisher to a fountain, the guys during our staff meeting in the middle of the week, they said, Dwayne, you're going to have to like, uh, explain what a fisher is because we don't know what that, that is. So I tried to think of a different word that started with F for my outline, but I couldn't come up with one. So um, class, a fisher is like a, cra- a crack or a crevice in a rock through which water might seep through. So think like on top of a mountain and there's a split and water's coming through it. That's a fisher. Got it? Edumacation. So the reason I wanted to call this point a fisher to a fountain is because of what verse 16 says when it says, from his fullness we have received grace upon grace. In Jesus' coming, we get the fullness of God. Grace upon grace. A fountain of grace. First, let's think about the fullness of God. For a minute. One of the old definitions for God used by this great old saint named Anselm is that God is a being of which none greater can be conceived. Whatever he is, whatever, whatever good or great qualities there are in the universe, that God, by definition, possesses them to the nth degree. So, for example, take a quality like, like love. God is love to the millionth, trillionth, kabillionth, infinitillionth power. If you think about something else, like his knowledge. He knows everything. Everything is power. He has the highest amount of power conceivable and even more than that. He's a full God of which none greater can be conceived. Anselm, he's, he's one of my favorite. I actually have the introduction to this part in his book tattooed on my arm in Latin. Um, but here's, here's what he says about this. And it's the way that he writes, it's, it's written in the form of a prayer. But I want to read this section to you and how he explains this. Speaking to God, he says, Truly you are perceptive 
omnipotent, merciful, and impassable, just as you are living, wise, good, blessed, eternal, and whatever it is better to be rather than not to be. Whatever you are, you are not that through another, but through your very self. You are therefore the very life by which you live, the wisdom by which you are wise, the very goodness by which you are good. God is a full God. It's actually connected to one of the mysteries of the Bible that the Bible never answers of why did God create anything at all? He's a full God. So he's completely sufficient, lacking in nothing. He didn't create anything because he was bored, lonely, incomplete, or obligated in any way. He was fully satisfied in and within himself, in and of himself. Fully satisfied as God. So the best answer is that, that theologians have given is that creation, God's actions, they're actually out of the overflow of his being. He is so full that he overflows the fullness of God. Uh, I'll tell you this. I guarantee something for every single person here in the room right now. Whatever, wherever you're at, whatever your idea of God is in your mind that you have, God is greater and bigger than that. Think of the greatest you think you could possibly think of God is even greater than that. All of our ideas here in this room fall short of how full God really is. The fullness that's beyond our ability to grasp. What verse 16 says here is that this is, it's out of God's fullness that he extends his grace to us. This grace upon grace. In the next point, we'll talk about the progression of God's grace in history. But for now, let's just pause and think, what is grace itself? What is grace? A simple definition of grace is God's favor toward people that they don't deserve, which they don't deserve. Mankind and every one of us, we, we deserve God's justice, his righteous judgment. But God doesn't automatically give that to us. Instead, he gives us grace. He extends his kindness and his favor and a way out of our sin and shame. Grace is God being good to us. We don't deserve it. So in our text says, grace upon grace, what is that? Is it two stages of God's grace? Like in the next verse may indicate, like the stage of grace when he gives his law and then the stage of grace when he sends his son? Or is it simply a superlative, a, a hyperbole emphasizing how good of a thing it was for him to, to, to extend toward mankind when he sent Jesus? To be honest, I'm not sure which one it is or if it's both in some way. Uh, what is clear is that the coming of Jesus is the pinnacle of God's grace, of his actions of grace. The giving of his son is the biggest gift that God has ever given to mankind. There's grace Every day, grace in that we were born and he gave us life. There's grace in the air that he breathe, we breathe that, that sustains us. There's, there's grace in the rain that we had last night and the sun that came out today in beautiful San Diego. But grace reaches its peak and its pinnacle in Jesus. He is the grace upon grace upon grace upon grace, the clearest and fullest expression of grace. And, and here's... Grace's connection with peace. The reason for our lack of inner peace, which is what leads to the lack of relational peace with other people between individuals and countries, is our own personal sin, which deserves judgment. But instead of giving us judgment right away for our sin, God withholds it for a time, to a special day ahead, in order to give us grace. And He gives us grace. Through Jesus. So he can go to the root of the problem, which is the reason why we don't have peace. Actually, the Bible says in James 4.1, he says, what, what causes quarrels and fights among you? Why don't you have peace? He says it's, it's inside in our, in our motives that we're at conflict within ourselves. Jesus is the epitome and the embodiment of peace because as he applies peace to our hearts, the root of where it all starts. So do you want peace, peace in your heart, peace in the world. 
It comes through the Son of Peace, Jesus. So do you feel lack of peace in, in your heart? What I'm talking about? I, I f- felt that. I've been there. When you just feel this turmoil inside and you're, you're restless and it's like you're just tangled up in, in knots. I know that feeling. I actually had one of those feelings this, this week and I just had to stop and take some deep breaths. <sighs> Remind myself, God, his grace toward me, that he loves me, that he's with me, that he's for me, that he gives to me. So I felt that uneasiness reside, subside, and the peace of our Lord settle my mind and my heart. If you feel lack of peace in your heart today, hear of God's grace. There is peace through the Son of Peace. Let's move on to our next point a manger to a mountain, and look at the progression of God's grace and peace toward us. Verse 17 says, The law was given through Moses, and grace and peace came through Jesus Christ. In order to understand what's going on here, we've got to know the story of when the law was given, where it says here the law was given through Moses. So, so here it is. Here's the story. I'm just going to read it straight out of the Bible. It's, it's mostly found in Exodus 19, and then a little bit more in, in some of the later chapters. So here it is from, from the book of Exodus in the Bible. So Moses came and he called the elders of the people and set them before all these words the, the Lord had commanded him. And all the people answered and said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, behold, I'm coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe, believe you forever. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Mount, now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, the whole, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And he gave to Moses. And when he had finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai, the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. And when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands, he came down from the mountain. Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he'd been talking with God. Okay. So get it. This is like a really big deal. A really big thing that happened. I mean... Imagine if we took our whole church out to, like, Cowles Mountain. I know it's bigger than that. But, you know, Cowles Mountain's a great place. Mission trails, go hiking there, done it with my family. So just imagine our, our whole church goes out there and um, Pastor Ryan Buss goes up on the mountain because he looks a lot more like Moses than I do. And, and so he goes up on, on the mountain and there's, like, thunder and there's this cloud and fire and God's voice speaking and then Ryan Buss comes down with these two tablets of stone with the Ten Commandments written on them and his face is glowing. That'd be a pretty big deal. That's crazy, you know? Pretty big deal. Monumental deal for God's people. That God would select them, the, the Jews of all the people on the earth to graciously give them his special words that he writes with his own finger so that his people might know him and live in his harmony and in his peace. It was such a big deal that eventually what ended up happening with the people over the years that they ended up thinking that the whole purpose and and point of these words that God gave the law was to be perfect people. Perfect words meant for perfect people. To make perfect people, but that wasn't God's point. God's purpose in giving the law was to point out the deep inner problem that we have. Why we have lack of peace. That no matter how hard we try, we can never obey all his law perfectly. And that once we realize that, we cry out for grace. Here's how Romans chapter 3, 19 and 20 explains it in the Bible. We know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, 
since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So, so God gives the law. And he lets it simmer for a few hundred years. I mean, essentially the whole Old Testament, all that was written in the Bible before Jesus came, is stories of people finding out that no matter how hard they try to follow and obey the law, they fail. Not a single person in all the Bible that obeys the law perfectly besides Jesus until that. Some of the people, you know, they, they realize this, and then they, they turn to God, turn to him for his grace, and they re- receive it. Maybe, maybe you felt like that. Felt like the whole purpose of life is to be a good person. But you found out that that's a pretty tall and actually impossible order. Maybe you thought that that's actually what Christianity is all about, just being a good Christian. You know, being a good Christian who says and does the right things. If, if you've thought that, but you need to know what I, what I want so badly for you to know today is that was never the purpose of God's law. Not the point of the Bible. God's law cannot save. It can only point to our need for salvation. Its point and purpose is to point to the Savior who has come. And, and that's why, my friends, why our text today says that the coming of Jesus in a manger, when he came, that it was an even bigger deal than what happened on Sinai. That was a, a big deal, but Jesus coming was an even fuller gift of God's Grace and truth. Verse 17 takes us from the mountain to the manger where we look in on the face of God. His grace and his peace overtakes our hearts. It's grace because it's God's act of favor toward us, even though we don't deserve it. And it's his truth, not only because it actually happens, a real thing that happened, but because it answers the real questions and the real challenges to peace. One of the most striking scenes, I think, from the Christmas story is when Mary, the mother of Jesus, when she's looking down on this brand new little baby and she sees the face of her Savior. The story's over in the Gospel of Luke. This multitude of angels shows up singing this song, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among with whom he is pleased that he has favor towards. And one of the angels speaks and says this, unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Mary, she hears all about this, and then she looks in on the face of baby Jesus, and here's what she says in Luke 2, 19. She, she treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. She treasures up these things and ponders them in her heart, that that little baby is the Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Undoubtedly, she, like any mom, just treasured the, the joy of having a brand new little baby. It's a wonderful thing. Unlike any other mom, she treasured the face of the one who came to save her from her sin and put peace in her heart. The the story of Mary is actually an interesting story. She's pretty much Jesus' very first disciple, and she's the only one who never seems to ever abandon him. She's there with him all the way to the end, to the foot of the cross when he is crucified. Mary's there. Today, when you think of Christmas and and all that it means, do you think of the babe and know him as the Savior who is Christ the Lord? His coming tells us that we could never save ourselves. God wouldn't have to God wouldn't have sent him if we didn't need saving. No matter how hard we try to obey God's laws, God has given us grace in Jesus in order to tell us it's okay. It's okay. When we truly accept that grace, it's peace. It, it covers our hearts. It enters our hearts. This morning, has the law been beating you up? You feel beat up by the law? You feel like you're just constantly failing and don't measure up? Are you tired of just trying and trying to be good? Do you feel the temptations and transgressions that they've just got you all tangled up inside? Know God's grace. He sent Jesus to come and to be born and to die 
for your sins so you don't have to be beat up and tangled up anymore. Jesus came to give you his peace. He is the son of peace, the epitome and the embodiment of peace. Oh, that we know his peace. Well, let's move on and go on to our third point, a rock to a revealing. This is from verse 18. Let me read it. Let me read it. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Okay, a few things here. First from line, no one has ever seen God, the only God. The, the only God here un, undoubtedly is a reference to uh, what is known as the great Shema. Um, it's sort of the main core value of and mission statement of the Jewish people. It's from Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our Lord, the Lord is one. The great Shema, the Lord is one. Those who believe in the Bible believe there is one God, just one. The only God reference, also likely a reference to the context in which John is writing this was writing, the Greco-Roman context, which was, it's, it's very similar to, was very similar to the way that our culture is today and that there were a lot of different gods and belief systems that people believed in. So when John says here, the only God, he's inadvertently saying that those other gods or belief systems in the land, that they're not true, that there's only one true God. So that's the only God part. Now, just hold on for a second, and we'll come back to it. For the, for the no one has ever seen God part. Let's think about that. We've got to go back to another Old Testament story with Moses to get a hold of what's going on there with that. Moses, at, at this point that it's referring to, is he's actually pretty discouraged as a leader because when he finally comes down uh, the mountain to the people, what he finds is that they've, They've taken off all their gold jewelry and they've put it in this fire pot and then they've made this golden calf that they're worshiping and calling God. Moses sees this and he looks at the like fresh Ten Commandments that God just wrote and gave him. And the first line is, he shall have no other gods before me. He's like, ah, come on. He actually throws them down and breaks them in, in anger, loses his temper, and so then has to make new ones. But, so after that, he goes to seek God in prayer, basically telling God he, like, he feels really alone and he doesn't think that he can lead this disobedient people. Uh, and God responds to him with these precious words that I love, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. God promises Moses that he will be with him He'll give him peace, ability to know him, which then Moses replies, it's like, okay, if that's true, God, then please show me your glory. I want some sort of confirmation of this. So here's what happens. I'll just read it straight out of the Bible. Exodus 33, 19 through 23. God says, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you will shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. And then I will take away my hand and you will see my back, but my face shall not be seen. An incredible episode. God tells Moses to go get in this crevice, this cleft on the side of the, the mountain and the rock, and while he passes by, he'll let God will let him see his back. Crazy story. A lot of rich, weighty things in, in that passage that we could talk about. The thing with people not being able to see God has really to do with his pure and utter holiness as being the source of all that is truly good and perfect. First Timothy 6.16, the Bible says that God dwells in inapproachable light. The idea is that God is, is holy and good. We're, we have sin, so sinful human beings, they can't look at God. The utter purity of God's holy righteousness would just disintegrate sinners in its face. So God covers Moses. Doesn't want him to get disintegrated. Standing before his pure Holiness. It's actually a theme throughout all the Bible until Jesus, that there is this separation between, between God and, and mankind. 
There's always some sort of, because of that, there's always got to be some sort of mediator, some sort of go-between between God and, and man, whether it's a priest or a prophet or a sacrifice or, or something. God's too good and, and too pure to fully look upon mankind. Man's too weak and too contaminated to be that close to God in his face. Until Jesus comes. Until Jesus comes and makes the Father known. The second part of verse 18 says so much. The only God has been made known in Jesus. Where it says Jesus is at the Father's side. The word there behind side really is uh, it's bosom. It's like in, his, his, in God's chest. Jesus is the very heart of God. So when, when Jesus becomes a little baby... God himself, is the very, he is the very heart of God fleshed out for the world to see. It's incredible. That's why in other parts of John, Jesus is called God's one and only son, his only unique son, because there's only, there can only be one. There's only one God and there's only one heart of God, and Jesus is it. He is the one who comes to make peace between God and man so that men and women no longer need to be separated from God but can be brought close. He comes to make peace. Jesus comes, and as the end of our verse says, to make him known. A lot of you probably know that the New Testament portion of the Bible, everything written after Jesus, that it was uh, written in Greek. That's why we have English translations. Um, so here's the crazy cool thing, at least to me. Uh, those last three little words of our verse, to make him known, they actually come from one word. And it's the word that we know as exegesis. Uh, exegesis is a word we teach in our class on the Bible here at the Resolve School of Theology. It's a class that reaches how to, teaches how to read and study the Bible. And exegesis, it literally means to, to read out of. Read out of something. So the goal of reading the Bible is to read out of what is already there. The opposite is eisegesis, where you read into something, where you you import your own ideas and opinions and and try and make the the text of the Bible fit your your preconceived beliefs. Eisegesis, reading into it instead of reading out of what is already there and submitting to and following that. Anyway, the cool thing here, a little nerdery, but here's the cool thing. Jesus is introduced in the first line of this book, the Gospel of John, as the Word. He is the Word. Verse 14 says he's the Word that became flesh and dwelt among us. And then here in verse 18, what we have is Jesus exegeting the Father to us. Jesus, the Word, reads out to us the very heart of God. So cool. Reads out the very heart of the Father to us. Remember our last, night, last point when we were talking about God's law, his written word that he gave on, on Sinai? What we have here in Jesus is God's book becoming a living being. God's book, his word, becomes a living being. So much so that later in Jesus' life when he's grown up and he's teaching and preaching, he says to people, he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. <laughs> Jesus is... God's book becoming a living being. And get this. After Jesus dies and and rises again, the last picture that we have of Jesus is him sitting on a throne and his face is shining like the sun. His eyes are blazing. And guess what? There's a bunch of people all gathered around him and no one gets disintegrated. (laughs) Instead, they're covered by Jesus' blood for their sins, and they're able to approach his throne of grace, and they worship him. Part of what we we celebrate in the Advent season is not only that Jesus came, but we celebrate his promise that he will come again, where we will finally one day get to see him face to face, the only one and true God, and we'll worship him. I long to see that day. I long to see him, to see my Savior face to face. Here's why. I've never known anyone as good as God. Earlier we talked about how big and how full God is, and yet He cares for me. Even though I'm a sinner, He 
sends his son so that we can know God and be known by him. I think a lot of the lack of peace that goes on in our hearts happens because, not necessarily maybe because we don't know God, um, but we don't believe that he knows and cares for us personally. Um, Another one of the books that I read when I was out on sabbaticals, this book called The Anatomy of the Soul by Kurt Thompson. I'll read a section of it to you. It says, When you keep your relationship with God exclusively fact-based and rational, it's easy to make judgments about others and yourselves and yourself. Such judgments reduce your anxiety and increase your sense of safety and protection. However, this way of being also has the curious effect of increasing the isolation you feel, both from others and within your own mind. If you allow yourself to be known by God, you invite a different and frankly more terrifying experience. You are now in a position of vulnerability. However, it is only through this process of being known that you come to know yourself and learn how to know others. There's no other way. To be known is to be pursued, examined, and shaken. To be known means that you allow your shame and guilt to be exposed in order for them to be healed. To be known is one of God's passions. When he, while he desires for us to have the experience of being known by him, just as important is his desire to experience being known by us. This is not simply for our benefit as if he's not affected by us. He desires to be known by us as much for what it does for him as for what it does for us. Christianity is not about being right. It's about being loved. To be known by God. To be known by Him. Does He know you? Does He know you? Mm. I'm not asking if you know God, (laughs) as if any of us could ever climb those heights the fullness of God. I'm asking if you are known by God. Jesus Christ came. It's Christmas to make the Father known. He came so that God's glory would no longer be shielded and separated from us because of sin. But He came to live and to die to cover our sins so that we could be known by God. All of us here in this room, we've got very levels of knowledge of God, about God. Some know more than others. I mean, you think that doesn't matter so much, how much of each one of us know. I think what what matters more is whether we're known by God. Not whether we know God, but whether He knows us. I want to be known by God. I don't want to be stuck and, and hidden in a rock. I want to see His face. I want to feel his heart. Jesus is the epitome and the embodiment of God's peace for us. Through him we are known by God. And we know God and we know his peace. And that peace starts to work in us and help us to have peace with other people. As the band starts to play, we're going to conclude and prepare to come to Jesus' table of grace and peace. And we've talked about a lot this morning. We've talked about how in Jesus' coming, God's grace and his truth and his peace, they come in fullness to us. They, they go from being just a fisher to a fountain. This morning, maybe, maybe you feel like you've only been getting small drops of water and you're thirsty. In Jesus, there's a fountain of God's peace a never-ending supply. If you're thirsty today, when you, you take the bread and you dip it in the wine or the juice, Drink, drink deeply. Think deeply of the peace Jesus has provided for by his blood shed on the cross. We talked about the mountain where God's law came and then the manger where his grace overflowed. This morning, maybe you feel pretty, maybe you feel beat up either by trying to do everything right and failing or because of someone else judging you in some way or another. Jesus came to a manger the the very low of the low so everyone would know it doesn't matter how low you are he has grace and peace for you
cracked or beat up, you eat the bread today, know that Jesus was born and beaten up on a cross so that he could heal you, heal your wounds, eat and have him heal you with his arms of peace. Lastly, we talked about being separated from God, from his light due to our sin. Jesus came so we don't have to hide in a rock anymore. He came to live and to die on a cross for our sin so that our sins could be covered with his hand. Because he did that, we can we can look to him, we can look up and see his face and know him and the peace that he gives. If you feel shame today and you're you're hiding, come out into the light. Christmas is about Jesus who came to cover the shame. Look to him through his eyes of peace and know that he loves you, cares for you, and wants you to be known by him. Let's go to him in prayer. Oh, Prince of Peace, thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. Lord, would you enable us to to drink from your fountain of peace? Lord, would we gaze upon your face and see your Savior? Would you heal us? Would you change us? Would you enable us to celebrate with true joy because of the hope you have given us and the peace that you have put in our hearts? Love you. Pray these things in your good name.